Okay, good morning, uh, everyone. So we'll spend, uh, I think, uh, 45 minutes um, discussing about TensorFlow uh, in the context of Scala uh, projects. Um, a few words about me and uh, where I, I uh, come from. Um, so I'm currently working uh, with Lunatech, a company based uh, in uh, Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and Paris, France, and we do uh, GVM development for enterprise, so usually shipping teams into uh, large projects. Um, we have also DevOps teams, and um, I'm doing development of the big data and machine learning side of the, these uh, projects, and we use a whole bunch of technologies uh, doing lots of Scala and Java and the stack you um, you probably know well, uh, going along uh, with Scala like Akka, Spark, uh, Kafka, and uh, you name it. Uh, we are about uh, 100 people from uh, a large set of nationalities, and we are basically leveraging lots of um, of uh, open source and um, and because we have started to do. Uh, machine learning at Lunatech. I, I came in the, the project coming from a background where I first started as a scientist in uh, academic projects where I got to learn about uh, distributed computing and storage uh, even before the time of uh, uh, the, the MapReduce uh, and Hadoop and the like and then jumping into the, uh, the wagon with uh, Spark, Scala. Uh, etc. in uh, as a consultant uh, so starting to work in the private sector um, and now going into this uh, engineering for uh, data science that is the mostly the the topic or the underlying context in which I would like to to put this um, this talk so the outline for the talk is to to describe remind you a bit about machine learning because maybe not everyone is familiar with machine learning techniques maybe raise a hand if you feel comfortable with it yes okay a few as usual so um yeah one of the the takeover if i go to the end <laughs> right now is that uh it may seem complicated, but there is not that much to know to be able, as an engineer, to integrate data science work into a solid engineering uh, project. Um, we do that um, at Lunatech with a large automotive, uh, uh, so car um, manufacturer. Uh, so it's a very big project, and we work with a team of data scientists with their own tooling, their own methodologies that are maybe more lenient in terms of uh, engineering, and we have the engineering team that is, has to work together with that, and it's, it's working uh, pretty well. So um, I will discuss a bit about an environment that is interesting for data science, which are uh, notebooks, uh, interactive programming. Then we jump into the TensorFlow framework, what we can do with it, what is the Scala API looking like, uh, then show how we integrate a TensorFlow model into a simple Akka HTTP, and then discuss what are the artifacts of data science teams and how should they be managed, because uh, we know that there is uh, quite some maturity now in terms of going software into production. We have DevOps, we have CI, we have everything required for you know the development pipeline to be really smooth in every case, right? Um, but we have to transfer this to the data science teams uh, as well. Okay, so a jump into uh, machine learning. So basically we live in a world where we have data flowing all over the place and we actually have access to a very powerful computing power, uh, which is, by the way, one of the reasons uh, why Scala is successful, because functional programming is now able to take over because we have distributed systems. So what we want to do with machine learning basically is take some data and generate just through an algorithm a model. And a model is just a function that is able to uh, represent one of the facets of the data. So if you want to speak in a kind of a Scala-like uh, 
lingo, you would say that, I would say that uh, data should be represented as a flat table, because in machine learning, you'll see that we are mostly dealing with matrices, arrays, everything double, because that's what the mathematics are doing, right? Manipulating numbers. So if you can flatten a table, you have a sequence of examples, and those examples are vector of features. So the different uh, columns, I would say, that you're collecting, and maybe one of the columns is an interesting thing that you want to predict, temperature, the class of an object in an image, you name it. But everything in the end could be represented as uh, this. A model is actually a function representing a facet of the data. That means if you have the features, you should be able to predict something. So it's a function that goes from a set of features and predict the label. You want to predict the temperature from the weather pattern of the past, right? You look at everything you had before, you generate a function, and you use that function to make predictions. How you make the you generate that function? Well, training is actually a function that will generate this function, okay? And the input is a data set. So you have a set of examples of the past, you have some magic, and you generate this function, right? Pretty simple. And the way it goes is to minimizing the risk that you will be wrong in the future, okay? So you have to minimize something that is called uh, a loss in the machine learning lingo. For example, the sum of squared error. So if you want to predict temperature, you want to have the difference between the real temperature and your prediction to be minimal, and it should, be, it should happen any day. So you sum all these differences, or the square of these differences, and it should be uh, minimal. So you take the data sets, and for each uh, case, you take the difference between the prediction and the real, the prediction and the real value, you square and you sum, okay? So all this has kind of a simple algebraic expression, if I may call it. There is not that much to know if you want to be familiar with the environment of uh, data scientists. Now, the missing pieces are how do you really build a model and what minimizing is uh, uh, implying. So first thing about the model. So I said there's a function, it's very, uh, generic, but in practice, it's just a set of parameters and how to use them with input data. So it can be represented as just a sequence of doubles. And in the example of a linear model, you would have your features. So maybe you're looking at the wind, at the pressure, uh, you name it, those are the features. And from this, you will predict the uh, temperature uh, tomorrow, and you would have a model. So you take all your features, you combine them with parameter by simply multiplying each feature with a certain parameter. You sum these things, maybe you had a constant, and you get it. So this is a very simple combination. It's the simplest possible combination of a vector of features. This is when you heard when you hear linear model, this is just this. It is that simple. Later, we will look into neural networks and more deep learning things. Everything is based on this, actually. Now you need to minimize this, and for this, you need kind of a, an algorithm. And uh, in short, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, the idea is to have methods that are uh, gradient-based. So the, the idea is that we want to minimize this uh, loss. As you see, so it's a difference, it's a sum of the difference between prediction and uh, reality. And the idea is to see, okay, for each parameter, how is the loss changing? So if I increase one parameter, is the loss increasing or decreasing? And you compute that for each of these parameter, and then you change each parameter in the right direction by a, s a simple, uh, small amount, and you have a new set of parameters, and you do that again. So you show the data, compute the loss, compute the gradient, 
change parameters and do that again. So you see it's iteration that is consuming the data over, 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 over. That is why training models is such a big task because it requires going uh, uh, through uh, batches and epochs. So seeing a full data set that is split into uh, small chunks a large number of times. And it is also telling you a story that is interesting because if you can batch by chunks of your, or I will not say partition because that sounds right, but or chunks of your data set, it, mean, it means that you can work in a distributed fashion, which TensorFlow will be able to do just like you would do uh, in Spark. Okay, one last thing about uh, these models, you have then to evaluate whether your model is working right. Um, and you can do that right after training, and you have to do that as well uh, while running live on your data. So you have evaluation of your model for validation to go in production, and then you have uh, evaluation of the model in the production to see if something is going adrift and maybe the model has to be changed for, uh, for this reason. So you use the same kind of expressions as the loss function when it comes to uh, uh, regression. Uh, if you want to do classification, so assign a label to your items. For example, if we, you think about images, uh, you would want to detect if you have a certain object, a person, a face, a dog, whatever. Uh, so this is a label, it's a, it's a class, so it's a categorical uh, prediction. And in that case, you may use classific uh, accuracy, uh, that is the percentage of correct uh, predictions. And those definitions of metrics are used as validation, for validation on test data that is not used in training. So this is uh, also one important thing that data scientists uh, do. Uh, they train the model on part of the data and then they measure its quality on another part of the data uh, to simulate the fact that the real quality of your model is when it goes live on, you know, example you have not seen uh, in the past. Because if you, cannot, if you can only predict what happened before, you will probably have little value in your, uh, your model. Okay, so... If I have to summarize what machine learning is implying, it's lots of vector matrix operations because it's iterative. Linear model, okay, it's a few parameters, but you will see in deep learning that it grows to thousands, even millions of parameters, lots of operations. Data is a multidimensional arrays of floats, so you may have many features. Imagine an image. Uh, that's, you know, millions of pixels. That's one example. It's two-dimensional array with three dimensions or four dimensions for the colors. So that's already three dimensions to represent one image. And then you had another one because y you have many images to train uh, on. Um, models are also represented as arrays of doubles and operators to combine them with the data. Right, so you see that you need uh, operations and you need uh, data structures. And that is allowing you to do training, evaluation, and inference. Okay, so you have different uh, machine learning frameworks. The reason we're talking about TensorFlow, who in the, the audience has learned about TensorFlow a little, or used it, yeah, a few. So, and Spark, Spark ML, yeah, more. So it's the same ID, except that you're, you're running um, in a different environment. Spark is, you know, the epitome of, I want to do distributed computing, okay. Um, TensorFlow is about, more locality and running on accelerated uh, infrastructure, accelerated uh, 
computing. So you want a lot of computing power to manipulate matrices that can hold uh, in, uh, in memory. So it's giving you uh, access to uh, tensor transformations, and I come in a mil so a tensor basically is a multidimensional array of either float or doubles, maybe strings, but mostly uh, floating point uh, numbers. And then on top of this capability to manipulate this uh, this data um, in a in a CPU or in a GPU where you would have thousands of threads running in parallel or in a TPU, those chips uh, designed with, uh, uh, with Google for even higher performance uh, parallel computing. So manipulating this and giving all sorts of uh, uh, operators, then you combine this into the, uh, the modeling and machine learning capabilities. But it's uh, more than that as we will uh, see in the, the coming minutes. So if you want to do that, uh, TensorFlow thing, probably you do that in Python by default. Uh, but it's not required, I would say. So most of the work uh, in the data science community is Python, true. Um, but because what, of what TensorFlow is trying to do, most of the, well, the core of the work is actually running as uh, low-level libraries on dedicated uh, hardware like uh, GPUs. So you can have on top anything that is commanding this uh, uh, this library to do your work, and there are, uh, there is a very good uh, library, TensorFlow Scala, uh, that was developed by uh, uh, Emmanuel uh, Platinos, if I'm uh, not mistaken. And uh, actually, well, you have the link to these and to a tutorial. Basically, there's this GNI uh, layer to interface the low-level library. TensorFlow is also providing some uh, uh, protobuf um, uh, definitions so that you have uh, an API that you can generate in different languages, including Scala. And then, because you have so much, you know, Python uh, libraries that are available, it's good to mimic those libraries to give productivity to the uh, the data uh, scientist. Okay, so. Uh, a few words about notebooks. Uh, many of you have used interactive uh, notebooks. Yeah, a few, the same, I guess. <laughs> okay, so uh, imagine you're doing data science. So you have a data set and say, oh, you have to give me a model to predict uh, uh, whatever uh, amount of money I will make uh, tomorrow. Well, it sounds like a, you know, a pretty vast uh, topic. So. You need knowledge of the data and explore uh, how you will guide the modeling, choosing the right methods, uh, and so look if there is corner cases, the data is corrupted, uh, if you have some, uh, some things to do. And, and once you know how to model, you will make probably many trial and errors with different parameters, so processing the entire data set over and over with uh, different methods. If you don't do that in an interactive uh, environment, it's going to drive you nuts. And because the data scientists have been working with interactive environment for a long time and with the MATLABs R and all sorts of toolings that are really not appropriate for proper engineering, um, it's good to have notebooks uh, in, uh, in Scala. And when it comes to the JVM, um, I think your best choice is, uh, is Scala, of course. So you have several options to do that. Uh, going um, the Spark Notebook, you can check out. It's a pure Scala play implementation of a, a notebook with the same kind of interface as the other ones. Uh, maybe uh, a good thing to look at and in integrate Sparks uh, uh, out of the box. Zeppelin, uh, same kind of thing. Uh, we will be working here with uh, Jupyter. Well, the drawback is that you need a Python environment to run it. Um, the good thing is that it integrates different language kernels pretty uh, easily, and uh, you should check out uh, uh, Jupyter to install it, and uh, Almond, which is um, uh, a wrapper of the Ammonite wrapper uh, that is giving you uh, Ammonite in the Jupyter uh, notebook. If you want to install it, 
uh, you go uh, local and you have access to GPU with TensorFlow, with Linux, well, only CPU on your uh, OS 6. Uh, you will need probably a virtual environment for your Python, install Jupyter, Corsair, Almond to wrap Ammonite, and you're good to go. Uh, if you want the easy pass, you may use, you know, cloud providers and um, Google uh, Collaboratory is giving you access to Jupyter Notebooks, and because you have access to a, to a console, you can install uh, Corsier and Almond, and there you go, you're uh, in Scala. I will not show this, I will work in local, uh, but it's pretty easy to do. Or whatever other provider you want to, uh, to work with. Okay, so this is what we will uh, be looking at right now. Tensors, variables, operators, sessions, how we run a training session and what feedback you get uh, when you do that. With a simple, the simplest linear regression example uh, we can think of. Okay, my Jupiter is down. So that's a nice one. Okay, there it is, sorry about that. There we go. So the notebook is a, is a web server. It gives you access to list of files. Some of these files are notebooks. That means it contains uh, cells with code, and this code can be executed in the REPL that is running uh, behind the scene. So you edit code, it's shipped into the REPL, and it, the, anything that is returned from the console goes into the, uh, the, the web page. So I'm opening here a first notebook. Where is it? There. Okay. So you see that you have access to the Ammonite usual suspects. Oh, this looks awful. Okay, so first thing I do is load actually a simple data set. I'm just doing, you know, regular Scala. Um, I point to my file and I do, you know, a simple uh, read of the file line by line. I drop the first line because it's CSV with a header. I split with a comma. Um, I trim, convert to float. And then for each of these rows, I'd say, I have an array here. I create a tensor containing the two values that I have in each row. So I have there a vector of tensors of float. So this is why we do Scala in the notebook instead of Python, because we have this, right? We know what we're dealing with out of the box. Um, so this is what the, the file actually looks like on disk. So I have a column that contains the price. It's a um, uh, housing market price. No, it's a land land price as a function of the surface of the land. And I would like to know, oh, if I have a, a this surface, what is the fair price for uh, for land? Okay. So I have um, a vector, and each of these row is represented as a tensor. So its deal is dealt with in the TensorFlow space. It's not anymore Scala that is manipulating the numbers. And then because I have an array, a vector of tensors, I want to make a single tensor with this uh, constructor. And you see that it now has a type, and it has also this, which is the shape of a tensor. So it tells you, if I call shape, that I have 19 rows, and two columns. Two-dimensional uh, array with 19 elements and two uh, elements. So tensors, multi-dimensional arrays, rank two because they have two dimensions, and the size of each dimension is given here uh, in the shape. If I want to recover uh, data back into Scala, I can point to an element and ask for the scalar value. I can point to one dimension and iterate over the values, make a, a sequence. So this is how uh, it's working. 
sequence of floats as a result. Okay, in the notebook you can do visualization. I skip the details, but I want to plot once against the other. What happened here? Yes, okay. So this is important. You work in notebooks, you have to know what you're looking at. So here I'm plotting the price as a function of the uh, the surface, and I want to find the line that is best matching this uh, data. So here we go in the machine learning part. And that is where uh, you get another concept, placeholder. So you will have to do computation with your tensors. So you're in Scala, and then you have to go into your, your GPU. So you need an entry point to feed in your computation. This is a placeholder. You define with uh, types what kind of data you will put in this uh, slot. It's just like a variable. So I will ship in a vector uh, tensor of floats with this shape. I don't know how many items I will put in there, but I know that it's, uh, it's one value that I put each time. It will be the input that is the uh, surface, and the output is the price. That is what I want to predict. Each time it's a single number. Okay, so this is my definition. And then I define my model. I said uh, a linear model is a bunch of weights, one for each uh, feature. There is only one feature. So it's a simple um, tensor that is variable. Why is it variable? Because I will have an iteration process where I will uh, adjust its value. So it has shape. 1-1 one, one because there is only uh, one element, but I want to store it as a matrix so that I have access to a uh, matrix multiplication. And uh, that is exactly what I do. Input is my uh, features, weights, I multiply as a matrix, and I get, uh, I get my prediction. That's what is a linear model. Okay. So what I described before is here. I need a loss. I need an optimizer, and this is what is uh, happening. My optimizer will minimize the loss. The optimizer is called Adagrad, whatever, and my loss is defined as before. Okay, and then I start a session. That means I will be able to do computation. Okay, boom. I take my data. So these are my, my tensors. And to run um, a computation, you know, I had this input. I feed the input with this feed map. And I run a session where I say, oh, I want to compute the loss. I want to get the weight values. And uh, I uh, evaluate the train operator. So this will trigger one step of training. So I show all the data update the parameters and see what is happening there. So here it starts with zero. So probably I need another iteration, please. Yes, see? So each time I'm doing manually, of course, which is not the prescribed way, but at some point it doesn't change anymore. So I have my, uh, my model that is uh, trained. Important thing about uh, this, there is a session and there is a graph. The graph is a representation of all the computation I've done so far. Just like in Spark, you have a computation graph and uh, you're able to uh, actually store it somewhere. So it can be serialized. These are defining a set, a combination of TensorFlow operation. You can serialize this on disk and run it elsewhere. And that is why you can do TensorFlow Scala and you're not dependent on Python. Because this thing you save and you use it from any thing that is eating the uh, TensorFlow library. And you have many, many things to do there. Um, to illustrate this, I'm actually writing now this, uh, this graph into a file that is uh, readable by something that is called TensorBoard. I don't think it's running there, so I have to start it. Uh, yes. So TensorBoard is also a very 
um, useful tool. Yeah. So because you can serialize many things on disk, okay, you can actually read those things and uh, have an access to to it. Sorry, I have my terminal dead, so I will do this from here. I need a shell tensorboard. Okay. So this is the this is the computing graph that we've defined here. We see that we have the gradients defined here, the minimization operation, the linear models depending uh, on weights, and then you have input that is being fed into the system. So this is uh, very convenient to uh, to think about uh, what you are actually doing there. Okay, I will f just finish this notebook to show you that we have something that is real. I compute the prediction, so this time I fetch the prediction by providing actually the same uh, input, and I will plot this. You see, so okay, it's, it seems that it's uh, it's working. There is no Python to that. It's just Scala pure, and it's using operations that are quite mimicking everything that you find in the uh, in the Python API. Okay, so. Take over is that, uh, yes, the notion of tensor, we've discussed that. So this is pretty low level. Uh, I will not show this API, but you have a data set API that allows you to abstract the notion of a data set uh, from very different things like text, images, uh, protobuf uh, records. Uh, it provides a basis for batching, so you define a data set, you can repeat it. Uh, because maybe you want to run indefinitely, you may want to shuffle, you define the batch size, so everything is provided uh, to allow uh, training. And because you have batches, you can also uh, shard uh, your data, so you can make actually distributed training, so you're, you're training your model on a large set of uh, CPUs. And you have an estimator API that is actually encapsulating everything we've seen so far. Uh, it allows to define this model signature, which is very important for engineering. Uh, these placeholders, they have a shape that is what you're feeding your model into, and the outputs also have a shape. And once you have those two things, whatever happens in the middle, it doesn't change in terms of engineering, right? Um, you have uh, everything to build a neural network, however complicated, and everything needed to uh, to follow training on the uh, tensor board, etc. Okay. So in a in a nutshell, we've seen you know a simple linear model, which may sound silly, uh, but you want to do very complex things. So just a few words about what is you know uh, deep learning. What we've seen so far is simple linear combination of uh, the data. Uh, we have, right? And it can be built with the uh, estimator API, like uh, a linear layer uh, of floats, and it has only one cell. So it is one combination of your features, okay? That's as simple as this. Then if you want to start to do neural network, you will create multiple linear combination of your features. Here, there is 128. So you have your input, and you will have 128 different linear models. But then you multiply this thing, you apply a function to this, which is ReLU, whatever it means. It just means that we discard negative values. It's just to provide uh, some, something that is asymmetric. It's very useful, for example, in image processing. 
And then you had another layer where each output of these linear models and rectified is going into a new linear model. So you see that you can pile up many, many layers and it adds to the complexity of the model, but it allows to fit things that are very strange and uh, non-linear. And deep is actually going into accumulation of layers and thus parameters. If you look at this, you have 128 cells times the number of features here, parameters to define these layers, this layer, okay? And then on the second layer, you have 128 times 64 parameter, etc. So you see it's growing very, very fast. And then you go into things like convolutional network that are used, for example, in image processing, where you, you are actually scanning an image with a little uh, filter. Here, it's an image, uh, it's a filter tree by tree that is, you know, sliding uh, everywhere. It gives a score to detect some pattern, for example, an edge. If you want to detect an eye, you need, you know, four edge on the four quadrants of the eye. So that would be four filters that you would have to find in uh, different places. And you have here, for example, 32 different uh, filters. So it's applied, so it's a lot of computation, many, many parameters that are able to detect some patterns uh, with locality uh, in an image. And then you select the ones that have the uh, best score. So you feel, oh, there is a, the edge of an eye there and another one here. And you make another layer of combination to see if this is built up to an animal, for example. So lots of computation, but lots of power in terms of uh, prediction. There are many uh, published uh, models available in TensorFlow. Uh, that means that we can actually consume them pretty uh, easily. And that is why I wanted to, uh, to show now, not in a notebook because we don't have time for this, but it's a, it's a little uh, Aka HTTP uh, application. The core of this is that we are, no, it's too small, right? No, it's not better. Okay, let's just run it. So the the core of this is to um, actually have a service uh, that reads a file, applies a pre-trained model to detect objects, and return the list of objects that were detected in the image. Okay, it's pretty simple. And because I have different models with the same signature, I'm able just by configuration to switch from one model to the other. So my model is not good anymore. If the data scientist is providing me a model with the same signature, I switch the model and I don't do anything in the uh, engineering side. So I'm not sure which version I'm running here, but we'll see. So if everything goes right, it's running, and I have a client here to play with. So I'm loading the protocol, right? I'm pointing to a local image here, image file everything to make a call to the uh, the service. So here I want to see what is the message. So I send the image and I want to see what objects uh, are found into this. It takes a bit of time. I'm not sure which model it is right now. Yes, yeah, so it's a, the face detector, right? So. Uh, It's just de de detecting faces, and to show you that I'm not uh, lying, I will just change the environment and restart the uh, setup. So I'm here just pointing to a new service, to a new model. Yeah. Turn, okay. Enter to kill it. Up, new environment, run.
and start over. The, run, the, the execution time is pretty slow because I'm on my CPU here. Uh, it would be better to run on a, a GPU. Okay, so it's just detecting different kind of objects, but it's just the same uh, the same uh, function. So there is um, no magic uh, about that. So going back here to uh, conclude. So if you want to solve machine learning model, and that is really where you do something with engineering, okay, uh, you may have common AI tasks that have inherent complexity. You, you squeeze it into TensorFlow as much as possible, and you provide consistent interfaces, and then you're good to go. Because after that, you do whatever you want, you know, leverage Scala strong consistency, uh, and uh, switch easily, so start a new Docker probably with a, a new model in a, uh, in a minute. So I don't have time to talk about uh, unit testing of in or integration uh, tests, but the idea is that you, you have to provide contracts uh, for your data scientist team to work with engineering. So a same model should have the same signature on the TensorFlow side. Use TensorFlow as much as possible so that engineering just has to connect into this. And this uh, will make uh, great uh, teamwork for your engineering project. Okay, uh, there are a few references to alternatives that I would not always uh, recommend. Uh, but uh, really the concluding thing for me is that uh, investing in getting you know, a lot done into the TensorFlow framework as TensorFlow operation that are serializable is giving you a lot of value because you can leverage anything on the technology uh, side uh, and for engineering. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you for your speech. Uh, there is a question. You mentioned that there is a some way to distribute uh, calculations for TensorFlow. Is there any integration with Spark? Or is one new feature for from TensorFlow to Scala? And one more, is there any analog of Keras and or other IPs that makes um, building ne neural networks more comfortable? Yes. OK, so uh, integration with Spark. Uh, the, there is a library, Spark TensorFlow. It's a, it's a Python project. So definitely, I think it would be very interesting to to have, you know, Spark integration with TensorFlow, but that's uh, yeah in Scala not yet, I would say. Um, but it's definitely where it is going, and it's definitely possible. Uh, Keras Keras is an API to make it easy to build those models by piling up layers like like it is done here. Uh, a lot of efforts have been done in the release of TensorFlow 2 to get, you know, Keras-like API, uh, the default way of working. Uh, I, I don't think it's yet reflected in the TensorFlow Scala API, but the way uh, you pile up uh, layers, as I sh have shown before, is not much different. Thank you for your speech. Uh, and my question is about computation. Uh, we saw that uh, computation takes quite a lot of time, maybe four seconds, maybe eight seconds. It's a uh, quite big amount of time. Yes. And have you had ever chance to see into TensorFlow Lite? So my idea is to optimize the model to avoid flawed computation. Yes. So uh, here, actually, uh, the the simpler model that I used here would run in 120 millisecond on my computer. Uh, the f the problem is that the first time the model has to load in memory, etc. So uh, there's an overhead that you have been all witness of. Uh, then, of course, uh, depending on the accuracy you want, and usually can be you can 
go down a bit, you, you should use those uh, TensorFlow Lite tooling to reduce the size of the models. That is definitely true. And it works on the JVM, it, even the TensorFlow Lite run engine. Uh, it works with Android, for example. So uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a way to go. It really depends on, here we're talking about Scala and the you know, full-fledged framework. So I'm thinking more of you know, heavy lifting of a uh, GPU. But you're definitely right. In many, many cases, TensorFlow should run on, on a, a lightweight uh, uh, engine. Thank you for, uh, for the talk. Um, uh, as Apache user, I know that uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, different uh, backends uh, from which uh, Spark can load uh, lots of data and process uh, S3, SQL sources, etc. Uh, what uh, options uh, do we have in uh, TensorFlow for this? Yeah. So TensorFlow is really, um, the core of TensorFlow is designed to work locally. So it needs access to computing power locally, and it basically has functions to access files. So you will need a layer uh, to, to get the files you know, right for TensorFlow to work with. So um, you would need a, you know, a SQL layer to get the data, or um, maybe the transform the data. But it, so uh, yes, on the access of the data, you have a bit of work uh, to do, uh, but you have to do it, you know, in a clever way. So probably having, you know, TensorFlow nodes really uh, close to to your your data. Um, but yes, and that is why Spark and TensorFlow integration would be of high value, of course, because that would be not the natural way to do. Okay, I prepare my my data and then I trigger a computation. Uh, with TensorFlow, and then I continue processing my data uh, as usual in Spark. Yes. Uh, thanks uh, for your talk. I have uh, beginner questions. Uh, 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 since uh, um, uh, Spark written in uh, uh, Java and Scala, and uh, uh, TensorFlow written in uh, C or C++, right? And uh, uh, using PySpark uh, give you. Um, a bit uh, latency with interaction with C libraries and uh, uh, JVM. Uh, do you encounter s such situations uh, at working with Spark and uh, at TensorFlow? Like uh, this library TensorFlow Spark, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes, uh, I haven't looked into the, the detail, but basically it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a Spark Pi uh, library that allows to trigger uh, TensorFlow computations. So uh, the overhead is really the, the Spark, typical overhead by PySpark, yes. Because the, the Python part, you have, the Python part is, uh, is making calls to this, uh, this the TensorFlow library anyway, right, so. Yeah. So thank you again. <laughs>